Ugh, finally. How many miles does a guy have to walk to buy a nightstand in this place? Huh? What's this? So, I'm writing this to document what I can only assume is my sudden descent into insanity. I can't possibly be that bad a navigator, and yet, as I write this, I've been trapped in Ikea for two days. I haven't seen another person in the entire time I've been here. I thought it was a prank at first. Turn the place into a maze, get all the people out, and see how long it takes me to get lost. Then everyone has a good old laugh. I realized that wasn't the case when I tried to backtrack. Everything had changed, so I ended up lost. Instead of the exit, it was just row after row of bookcases. So, I'm trapped in Ikea. Sounds like the setup for a bad joke. The lights went out at 10 p.m. It nearly gave me a heart attack. That loud electrical thunk sound and then pitch blackness. The place is full of beds though, and my phone has a flashlight on it, but no damn signal. So I found a bed and went to sleep. Spent most of the next day trying to find my way out with no luck. Did find a restaurant serving those meatballs though, so at least I won't starve. Made my way back to the beds before the lights cut out again, since it's too dark to search with them off. Introducing YouTuber's Life 2, because sometimes we all need an escape. The sequel to the pioneering life simulator game YouTuber Simulator expands its universe, creating this new open-world adventure where you get to live the life of an emerging YouTube superstar in New Tube City. Meanwhile, I'm trying to keep the world from ending. Start your own channel and create viral content. Record, edit, and publish a variety of videos to your new tube channel. Generate views and gain millions of subscribers. You can even stream live on Glitch and post photos to your Insta Life, which I'm doing purely for research purposes. Explore the bustling city, buy items, exercise, make friends, attend special events, and even bump into other famous YouTubers to help grow your network. Just hope that your city isn't wiped out by a cognito hazard anytime soon. So, what are you waiting for? You can purchase YouTubers Life 2 on Steam through the link in the description. It will also be available on Nintendo Switch, PlayStation, and Xbox. Now, back to the video. It's 9.10 a.m. now. The lights came back on a little while ago. I'm sure I've searched the entire area around where I came in now, and the exit obviously isn't here, so I'm going to pick a direction and hope for the best. Day 3 of my magical IKEA mystery adventure. If I wasn't sure that there was something seriously weird about this place before, I am now. Walked for 3 hours in a more or less straight line before I came across a ladder next to one of those huge stock shelves they have here. Climbed up to get my bearings and it looks like this place just stretches on forever. Like that scene from The Lion King, except instead of trees and grass, it was all shelves and tables and crap. I did see a person moving not too far away though, so I headed over. Thought it was a staff member at first, it was wearing the uniform, and hell, maybe it was. Maybe freakish seven foot tall monsters with long arms, short legs, and no faces are just the kinds of things they want working at Super Ikea. Damn thing completely ignored me though, and with no eyes or ears, I can't even be sure it knew I was there. I thought about shoving it or something to get its attention, but its hands were big enough to crush a watermelon, so I decided against it. It just kept moving along and eventually I lost sight of it, so I decided to carry on the way I was going. Anyway, no comfy bed for me tonight. Looks like I've entered the improbably hard and pointy table section of the store. Guess I'll have to make do with some bunched up tablecloths. Phone battery died during the day too. Didn't work anyway, but I feel like I've just lost some vital lifeline. You ever see one of those cartoons where they're going through doors in a hallway and they just pop out of another door in the same hallway? That's how I feel right now. I've seen nothing but the same identical bookshelf for two days now. Just row after row after row of them. I mean, come on, I love books as much as the next guy, but this is excessive. I'm obviously still moving forwards though. I can see the signs hanging overhead passing by. Too bad none of them say exit. Not sure who I was addressing that question to. Let's just say it was practice for the autobiography I'm going to write when I get out of here. I'll call it my perfectly normal trip to a regular old Ikea. Finally found some other people. Yeah, turns out I'm not the only poor bastard trapped in here. Lucky for me, I guess. My sixth night here, two of those staff things came at me in the dark. Different from the first one I saw, but still messed up. Heard them coming, they were saying that the store was closed and I had to leave the building, all nice and polite-like. I'm not sure which part of that was weirder, that they don't have mouths or that they were apparently trying to kill me while they were saying it. Came at me like rabid dogs, so I liked it, sprinting through Ikea in the dark like a madman. 
I saw it when I cleared another stand of those giant stock shells, all lit up with torches and floodlights. They built a whole town in here. Got a massive wall built out of shelves and beds and tables and whatever else. I swear to God, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Anyway, I guess they saw me coming, or maybe they heard my girlish, manly bellows of fear because they had the gate open and two people were there waving me in. Heard the staff thing slam into the gate behind me after it closed, still politely informing us all that the store was now closed. They wandered off eventually, though. They call the town Exchange, because that's what's on the sign hanging from the ceiling directly above it. Exchange and Returns, all lit up against the night using lights they found and plugged into the power lines. And there are beds and food and people. Over 50 wonderful people with regular-sized limbs and a full set of facial features. It's now my seventh night here, and the first one not spent in darkness. A full week living in Ikea. There's probably a TV show in that somewhere. Now that I'm around other people, I'm starting to feel more normal. Maybe normal isn't the word, but after a week with only the sound of my own footsteps for company, I was becoming increasingly sure that I'd just gone nuts. That I was tied up in some padded room somewhere, banging my head against the wall. But no, I feel quite sane now. Thank you very much. Apparently there are other towns out there. Some with more people, some with less. I found that fairly mind-boggling. How can that many people go missing with no one noticing? Surely someone would have noticed that everyone who goes to Ikea seems to vanish. Or maybe it's not everyone. Maybe we're just the lucky ones. The people here just call those monster things the staff. Apparently they're fine during the day, minding their own business walking the aisles. As soon as those lights go out though, they go bonkers. So during the day, people go out to find food, water, and whatever else they need. Apparently there are restaurants and shops around that randomly get restocked. No one knows how. Maybe the staff do it. Apparently they aren't very good at their jobs though because the restocking sometimes takes a while, which means the food needs to be rationed. Maybe if they weren't so busy chasing people around in the dark, they'd get more done. Anyway, when night comes, the staff go nuts and everyone holds up inside the walls. Apparently it's the same everywhere in this place, whatever this place is. The Ur-Ikea from whence all other Ikeas spring. Or maybe we're all just still in the regular Ikea and this is all some fever dream brought on by mind-numbing boredom. Who knows? Been here for 10 days now. Most of the people I asked said they stopped keeping track a long time ago. One guy, Chris, said he'd been in here for years. Years. Apparently there are rumors of people who do manage to get out, and of people who see the exit, only to have it vanish before their very eyes. I get the feeling not everyone believes that, but I do. It explains how we got stuck in here in the first place. Sort of. And I mean, come on, staff monsters, row after endless row of high quality Swedish furniture. I don't know why they would find a disappearing door so hard to believe in. I went out scavenging for food at a nearby shop with Sandra and Jerry today. Once you learn the landmarks of this place, it's not so hard to navigate. The overhead signs help a lot, but there are others. Not too far in the distance, a huge section of those giant stock shelves has collapsed against each other, and way off in the east, we all assume it's east anyway, apparently IKEA doesn't sell compasses, is some kind of tower that looks like it's made out of wood, reaches all the way to the ceiling. Maybe they were trying to break out through the roof. Lights up at night, so there must be some people there, but it's apparently a few days walk, which means it must be miles away, so no one here really knows for sure. Apparently, I got incredibly lucky sleeping out in the open for a week without getting ripped to bits by the staff. That's me, lucky, lucky, lucky. We found some food in the shop, guess the staff restocked it during the night, which was nice of them. There was a telephone on the wall, so I figured I'd try it out. There was a voice on the other end, but they were just talking nonsense. Random words strung together with no real meaning. You ever see a video of someone with aphasia? Kind of sounded like that. They didn't answer me when I spoke to them anyway. Sandra says all the phones in here are the same. I was thinking last night. The ceiling on this place is pretty high, and as far as anyone can tell, it goes on forever. Shouldn't there be some kind of weather in here? I'm sure I read about some NASA building that was so big it had its own weather patterns with clouds and stuff. This place is definitely bigger than that. But now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure I've never felt so much as a temperature change in here. I'll add it to the grand list of weird BS. The staff attacked the exchange last night. Must have been 20 or 30 of them all just asking us to leave the store calm as you like while trying to smash the walls down with their bare hands. Apparently this happens pretty regularly, so everyone is prepared for it. Knives from the restaurants, lawnmower blades made into hatchets, fire axe. One guy with seam even made a functional crossbow. Anyway, the walls have holes in them, which I hadn't noticed before, specifically so we can stab out at the staff when they attack. Took a couple of them down myself. They don't seem to bleed, which is weird. 
but they go down as easy as a regular person once you start sticking holes in them. We had to haul the bodies away in the morning. Apparently, the dead ones will attract more during the night, so we had to get them away from exchange. We have a couple of those trolley things they use to move big boxes around, so we loaded them up and took them over to pick up. Apparently, people just name everything in here after whatever sign is hanging overhead. Pickup was grisly. There were hundreds, maybe thousands of dead staff all piled up. There was no smell, which was a blessing. Apparently, in addition to not bleeding, these things don't rot either. My curiosity got the better of me while we were unloading them, so I took a look at one of the more cut up ones. They're just skin, or something that looks like skin, all the way through. No muscle, no bone, no organs. Are they even really alive in the first place? They certainly seem like they have bones while they are moving around, pounding on the walls. And I'm sure I felt more resistance than just skin when the knife went in during the night. Maybe something happens to them when they die. Just one more thing on the ever-increasing list of weird stuff that goes on in here, I guess. Something occurred to me after the staff attack the other night. Every time you see a situation like this on TV or in a film, like it's the end of the world or everyone is trapped on an island or whatever, once groups like ours start to form, people always seem to turn on each other, fighting for food or dominance or whatever else. That hasn't happened here. Apparently people from other towns come by from time to time just to check in or occasionally to trade if they are short on something. But everything is always cordial, friendly even. Maybe people are just better than they are generally given credit for. That's a nice thought. I think I'll go with that one. A dozen people showed up at the gates this afternoon from a town called Trolleys. Apparently, the staff broke through the walls and tore the town apart during the night. These 12 are the only survivors out of over 100. We let them in, obviously. One more point in the human decency column. Later, I asked if anyone knew how many of these towns there were out there. Between us and the new folks, we managed to come up with over 20 names. 20 towns filled with people, and who knows how many beyond that. The motto for this place should be, how is that even possible? Surely someone somewhere must be looking for the thousands of people that must be in here. I've been here for a little over two months now. Not that much changes, as it turns out. A couple of new people showed up, same story as the rest of us. Nice little trip to Ikea, and suddenly they're trapped in Billy Bookcase's house of faceless weirdos. The staff attack the exchange once or twice a week. We kill them and haul their bodies off. Sometimes they hurt some of us first. They killed a guy called Jared a couple of weeks back. It was awful, frankly. Turns out regular humans still bleed in here, even if the staff don't. We tried our best, but none of us are doctors. Jared was a good guy. He deserved better. We all do. It occurred to me a couple of days after that, none of us were really looking for a way out of here. I don't even know where we'd start. One of those quadcopter things with a camera attached buzzed past exchange today. I thought it meant that someone was finally looking for us, that help was on the way. Apparently it's not the first time this has happened though. Same thing happened a few months ago, and everyone is still here. No idea if it saw us, it didn't stop if it did, just kept flying until we could no longer see it. I started talking to people about the stuff they missed from home during dinner today. Probably not the best idea I've ever had. Everyone seemed pretty down after. A bunch of people here have families, husbands and wives, kids, dogs. Franklin apparently has a pet llama, though I'm not sure I buy that. But apparently some of the people here have some seriously odd gaps in their knowledge. Three of them had never heard of the International Space Station. Two of them seemed to think was the Prime Minister, and one of them had apparently never heard of the Statue of Liberty. I believed them too. They seemed just as confused as the rest of us. The more I thought about it though, the more it started to explain a few things. What if the reason no one is looking for all us missing people is because we haven't all come from the same place? This is going to sound weird, maybe that should be the motto for this place, but what if all the people here have come from different dimensions, realities, whatever you call it. I've seen enough TV shows to know the drill. Sarah comes from a place where there is no Statue of Liberty. They didn't launch a space station where Wasim is from. If everyone here comes from different places, even from ones that seem identical, there'd be no huge missing persons panic, no mass search. We'd just be a blip, a single missing person in a world of nonstop news. Well. That was a fun train of thought. Just realized that yesterday was the six month anniversary of my arrival here. I wonder if Ikea sells party hats. The routine around here has remained more or less the same. More new folks show up, one every couple of weeks or so. Food supplies go up and down, but we've never actually had a major shortage. Occasionally we get a visitor from one of the nearby towns, usually checkouts or aisle 630. We check in with each other from time to time. Occasionally trade supplies if someone gets particularly low on something. It's comforting in a way, a reminder that we aren't alone in here, 
some small glimmer of civilization. Sometimes they bring medical supplies. Apparently there's a pharmacy a few towns down from checkouts that gets restocked every now and then, so they share out what they can. I've never heard of an Ikea with a pharmacy before, but at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if someone stumbled on an Ikea organ harvesting lab. It would certainly explain the staff. Speaking of our faceless jailers, their attacks have been getting worse lately. Three or four times a week now, with twice as many staff as there used to be. No idea where they all come from, or why the attacks have increased. We tried following one of them during the day a few weeks ago, me and Sarah. Wanted to see if they led back to a staff room or something. They didn't seem to go anywhere though, just randomly walked through the aisles. We had to turn back before we found anything. We've been reinforcing the walls, trying to arm ourselves better. Certainly no lack of materials to use. Wasim has been making more crossbows, but it's pretty slow going. Too bad Ikea doesn't sell guns. The attacks are getting bad now, almost every night, and with so many staff that the bodies almost pile high enough for others to climb the walls. I think we're in real trouble here. I think exchange is done. We got hit pretty bad last night. Not many casualties, but the wall is wrecked. We finally figured out why the attacks had been escalating too. A box of supplies had a chunk of one of the staff in there. No idea how it happened, but apparently a piece of one will draw them as well as a full body. Too late now in any case. There's too many bodies for us to haul away and still have time to fix the wall before night. Candace has called a meeting. I suspect there will be talk of abandoning exchange. Maybe try and get shelter at checkouts or something. It's already getting late though. I don't think we'll have time to make it. Maybe some of us will. I was fine for that first week out in the dark after all. But then, how often can I keep getting lucky? I'm only writing this for a sense of closure, I guess. For me, or for who anyone who finds this. If this is the final entry here, I hope whoever is reading this is doing so from outside of this place. My biggest fear? If I do die tonight, I'll just wake up here again in the morning. Hmm. Weird. I wonder if they're still selling those meatballs. Oh, crap. Uh, hello? I'm still in here. <laughs> hello? Initial descriptions of the object were a pair of black spectacles capable of killing the user and covering their body in strange pictures from an unknown children's book. It was obviously where's what? Kurt, stay professional. I just want to bring some life into Merrick's robotic speech. There's a picture on the wall. Good. Think it has something to do with the anomaly? Of course. It looks like Waldo. Do we have any idea on where the object may be? Uh, I think it's in here. I have discovered the object. It was rested. Uh, resting on the toilet. Good. You know the drill. Yep. These are the ones. I'll put these in a baggie real quick. There's an inscription here. Where? Over here, on the wall. This was definitely not here when we first got here. Should we just leave it be and tell command about this, or...? It's most likely mimetic. Here, let me translate it. I have training. Ah, uh, well, never mind. Doesn't appear to be mimetic. It says... The basement. The corpses from a child's book are in the basement. He is there too. Fur. And then it cuts off. Are you okay? What the? Please! Oh God! Please! Command! We need assistance! ASAP! Help! Ah. 
When the transcript was received by a nearby site, it immediately went into lockdown, as SCP-4885 killed most of its personnel. The O5 Council enacted an emergency meeting, and procedure Invenient Aum was created, which consists of the following plan of action. 36 containment chambers are to be connected to an independent self-driving vehicle. One D-Class subject is to be submitted into the system of containment rooms. An AI will randomly select a room for them to enter first. Each containment chamber has a single digital monitor. Once a D-Class subject is transported to a random chamber, a message is to be sent to every monitor simultaneously. This message consists of the current location of SCP-4885. After approximately two hours, each containment chamber is to be transported to a randomly designated foundation site by a self-driving trucks. Little is known of the origin of SCP-4885. Given the appearance of Sumerian cuneiform at the site of Chai-19's unfortunate end, researchers have begun looking into museum logs, looking for hints as to where this mysterious creature originated from. So far, nothing substantial has appeared beyond this stone block etching. It contains a figure suspiciously like 4885. It is an anomalous humanoid resembling the main character of the popular series of puzzle books, Where's Waldo? This entails that it wears a horizontal red and white striped shirt, a red and white bobble hat, and jeans. However, a noticeable difference in appearance from the character is the entity's paler skin and the lack of eyes. In the event that a subject knows of 4885's current location at any given time, it will move to the nearest wall and begin to phase into it. 4885 will appear inside of the subject and will reach up the esophagus and grab the subject's chin through their mouth. However, if SCP-4885 is close enough to the subject when they discover its location, they will instead approach the subject, attempt to climb into the subject's mouth, enter their abdomen, and exit their body through the subject's pelvis. During this time, 4885 can easily dislocate and relocate any joint in its body, and its skin and muscles will gain the consistency of a malleable solid, allowing it to easily climb into and out of the subject. Dash 1 instances are anomalous corpses that were created by the SCP. The entire body of a Dash 1 instance is covered in illustrations similar to those found in Ware's Wally books, with many different characters appearing on the instance's skin. These illustrations originate from the liquid that exits the corpse's mouth. Currently, no instances of the cartoon character Wally have been found on a Dash 1 instance. If a subject knows the location of any Dash-1 instance, the SCP will teleport itself to the subject and kill them in the exact same manner as if they discovered SCP-4885 itself. Currently, Dash-1 instances are held in a secret facility known as Location I. Andrew Pent is the creator of this contingency. Recently, I was alerted to the apparent danger of 4885 and the corpses that it creates. Here's my proposal. I will require no D-Class, nor any help from anyone. I will create an algorithm for drones and other machines to detect Dash-1 instances, grab them, and deliver them to a specific location, which I will refer to as Location I. Location I, as far as any of you are concerned, will not exist. This Location I will be known to no one except for me and me alone. I will establish Location I in the algorithm that I've created, and I will allow Dash-1 instances to be dropped off at Location I. Any of you that know 4885's effects know where this is going. Once Location I has been established and the algorithm is up and running, I will exile myself to a location that, as far as any of you are concerned, will not exist. I will cast myself to the forest and I will wait for SCP-4885 to take me. Roughly three days after I exile myself, activate Procedure Invenient EM, and do not go looking for Location I. If you're reading this and you're not in O5, then everything that I just said has already happened, and this proposal is a success. No need to pray for me. Instead, pray that you never find Waldo. 
Another great presentation, Doctor. New Foundation personnel have been loving watching these instead of reading droll files. Thank you, Director. But is that really the reason you called me in here today? No, I'm afraid not. There's a problem, isn't there? Yes, a very large one, in fact. I trust you'll keep this in confidence. Do I look like I'm going to be gossiping anytime soon? I know, I'm required to ask. As you may know, there has been an increase of containment breaches on this site. Yes, 106 really killed some of our best researchers and guards. The new help isn't great. I believe it goes deeper than that. Really? Yes, I believe we have a mole, Dr. Buck. Do you have any hard evidence? Not that I don't trust you, but we must be sure in matters like this. Of course. This morning, an encrypted data pack was transmitted from our server room. What were they transmitting? Given the traces of hacking they left behind, I believe Location I has been compromised. Location I? After everything Dr. Pent worked so hard for? Yes, and worse yet, I don't believe they're working from some hippie organization like the Serpent's Hand. I believe they work for the Chaos Insurgency. I think it's over here, man. Come on! There's no way it's as big as you say. Keep it down! There's people around! I think it's... Yeah, sure. That's pretty tall for a slide. Can we go now? This was my childhood, man. I didn't come all this way not to go down it. You ever go down the slide like this? Head first, arms at your side? It's like you're flying, man. What? <clears throat> I believe everyone is here. It's about time we got started. For those of you just joining this operation, we'll quickly review the facts. One week ago, Dale Larson was reported missing by longtime friend Henry Birch. He claimed that Dale vanished before his eyes while going down a playground slide. It was only when Officer Kilgore went down the slide face first that the Foundation was alerted. Dr. Derritz and MTF were the first on the scene. Dr. Derritz. Yes, thank you, Dr. Buck. When we first arrived, we immediately investigated every piece of playground equipment and found that only the slide held anomalous properties. Now designated SCP-1562, it is a metal playground slide measuring 2.2 meters high and 3.4 meters long. The object's anomalous effects only manifest when a person slides down head first on their stomach with their arms tucked down at their sides. Any other orientation of the body or limbs while sliding results in no effect, and only human beings are affected. When a person slides down SCP-1562 in the aforementioned manner, they will disappear instantly and completely at approximately 15 centimeters before the end of the slide. So far, no one who has disappeared while using SCP-1562 this way has been recovered. We are to immediately start testing, devising strategies of recovering lost individuals and formulating a hypothesis of its origin. Yes, Gustav? What if we gave a D-Class a two-way radio earpiece to communicate with researchers observing the test? We could at least get an idea of what's happening on the other side. Does anyone have a non-blatantly obvious suggestion? Looks like we're ready. You may proceed. So I just go down this slide, and then... You relay what you see to us. Is that understood? Uh, yes ma'am. Here goes nothing. Well, that makes recovery. Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. I can hear you. Where are you now? I don't know. Some sort of small tunnel. It's really cramped. How do I get out of here? Can you describe it to me? No, it's too dark. 
can't see anything, and I'm stuck. Stuck how? I'm still head first on my stomach, and my body's at an angle, but I'm trapped. I'm completely surrounded by rock or dirt on all sides. I don't have enough room to raise my head or move my arms, and I can't move forward. I really want to get out of here now. We're going to try. Can you see anything? Anything at all? No, I told you I can't see anything, but I'm getting kind of freaked out. Not normally claustrophobic, but this is pretty damn uncomfortable. Pull me out of here. Unfortunately, your safety line was severed when you disappeared, so we can't pull you out. We'll try to figure out another way to retrieve you. For now, just stay calm and keep talking to me. No, 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 no. You need to get me out now. Please stay calm. We'll have you out of there as soon as possible. Okay, I was able to warm my way forward a little bit, but my head hit something. What did you hit? It's a shoe, I think. It's small. Jesus. What's wrong? Please, just get me out of here, Doctor. Get me out of here now! Calm down. We'll get you out of there as soon as we can. No, you need to get me out of here right now! The shoe. It's so... This is going nowhere. Where has he been transported? How do we retrieve people from the other side? Maybe we jumped the gun with the D-Class. I say we go back to basics. See if we can find a way to get an animal through. We've exhausted all those options. Next time, pay closer attention during our mission briefing. Sorry, Dr. Buck. It has to be a D-Class. They just need the right equipment. Send another one in and tether them with the strongest stuff we've got. And they need outfitting with video and audio recording equipment. Maybe even a GPS tracker and a headlamp, too. That should cover all of our bases. Then we can drag both of them out at the same time. I concur. Are you still there? Please. Please, I don't want to be in here anymore. We're going to send someone in to pull you out. It started talking. What started talking? The little boy did. But it didn't make any sense. Tell me what he said. He... He just kept asking where he was, and I told him I didn't know. But I don't think he was really talking to me, because he didn't respond to my voice, and he told me to stop crying when I was actually sort of calm. What else? Was he moving at all during this? I don't think so. He started screaming, and I told him to shut up, but he just kept screaming and crying and asking for his mommy. Then he finally stopped, and shortly after that, you contacted me again. Please, get me the hell out of here. Okay, we're sending someone in. Don't panic if you hear or feel something behind you. Please hurry, my chest. We need to get him out ASAP. He won't survive much longer, and any information he's collected will go with him. Agreed. Let's get that D-Class ready. Shortly after this, D-8600 was sent down SCP-1562. D-8600 was selected for his small stature and thin body shape, in hopes he would be able to move more easily than D-2445. The rope used to tether D-8600 was severed at the same moment D-8600 vanished from SCP-1562, and the GPS tracker signal could not be traced. The following audio was recorded after contact was established with D-8600. D-8600, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Doctor. What's your situation? We're not getting anything on the video feed. I'm in some sort of cave or tunnel. It's really small and dark. My headlamp stopped working as soon as I got in here. Are you able to move at all? I'm not sure I can get my arms up in front of me, but I can sort of wiggle my way forward. Wait. What is this? Hey! Are you alright? D-8600. I just bumped into someone's foot. They're not moving at all. Hey! Are you okay down there? That could be D-445. Try his radio. I can hear his radio. I think. I can hear his voice. Hmm. We're not picking up Davis's voice on your radio through our end. Yes, Doctor. I can hear you. Gustav, turn that off. I can hear him through D-8600s. Hey, man. I'm glad... I don't know. Some sort of small tunnel. It's really cramped. How do I get out of here? D-8600 is behind you and is there to help get you out. No, it's too dark. I can't see anything, and I'm stuck. Hey, man. It's okay. We know you're stuck, and we're both going to get out of here. I'm still head first on my stomach, and my body's at an angle, but I'm trapped. I'm completely surrounded by rock or dirt on all sides. I don't have enough room to raise my head or move my arms, and I can't move forward. I really want to get out of here now. Okay, man. It's okay. I'm going to try to get my arms up, and I'll grab a hold of your ankles. They should be able to pull us out of here, then. No, I told you I can't see anything, 
but I'm getting kind of freaked out. Not normally claustrophobic, but this is pretty damn uncomfortable. Pull me out of here. I'm working on it. Have some- D-8600, stop talking. Something isn't right here. D-2445 is just repeating everything he said to me when we initially made contact with him. No, 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 no. You need to get me out now. It's okay, doctor. I think he's just freaking out. I've almost got my arms in front of me. Okay, I was able to warm my way forward a little bit, but my head hit something. No, he's literally repeating his side of the conversation, word for word. Did he actually move at all, like he just said he did? I don't think so, but I got his ankles. See if you can pull us out now. It's a shoe, I think. It's small. Jesus. Doctor? What is he talking about? Can you just pull us out of here? Please, just get me out of here, Doctor. Get me out of here now! We can't pull you out. I'm sorry. No, you need to get me out of here right now! The shoe. It's so tiny. What the hell are you talking about? Why can't you pull us out? What does he mean the shoe is so tiny? D-8600. Unfortunately, the rope we tied to you was severed as soon as you vanished. We didn't realize that would happen. It started talking. Shit. Okay then, I'll try inching my way backwards. I won't be able to bring him with me though. The little boy did, but it didn't make any sense. Good luck, D-8600. We'll stay in contact with you he for the time being. just kept asking where he was, and I told him I didn't know. But I don't think he was really talking to me, because he didn't respond to my voice, and he told me to stop crying when I was actually sort of calm. This would be a lot easier if you so. would just shut up. He started screaming and I told him to shut up, but he just kept screaming and crying and asking for his mommy. Then he finally stopped and shortly after that you contacted me again. Just Please shut get the, me hell the hell up out already. Of here. Creepy asshole. Are you making progress, D8600? A little. It's not easy, but I'm getting there. The air is getting kind of stale. I hope there's enough for me to make it back. Hey, did he finally shut up? Not hearing him on my end anymore. Well, thank God for that. I was starting to think that... What is it? You were starting to think that... D-8600. D-8600? Are you still there? What happened? Try him again. D-8600. Respond. D-8600. I think the connection has been cut. He could have backed up into another portal of some sort. A valid hypothesis. We'll need another D-class to test it, though. No. We need to suspend testing and get this thing to the Foundation. There's too many variables here. I think he's right, Dr. Buck. It's better to be on the safe side. <sighs> Fine. We're moving out, people. I want this site packed up and ready for transfer in 15. SCP-1562 is currently quarantined in Testing Lab 46V in Site 24. The door to the lab is to remain locked at all times. As testing is currently suspended indefinitely, all access is denied unless special clearance is granted by Dr. Carver. This one just gives me the heebie-jeebies. You do realize it's your childish attitude that's standing in our way, right? Our way of what, Dr. Buck? Of discovery! We still have no clue how this thing operates, and we're locking it away for God knows how long. We lost two personnel. We lost two D-Class, Gustav. When has that ever stopped us? You continue to disappoint me, Gustav. Testing has resumed on SCP-1562 thanks to Site Director Zolgamax's approval. D-Class personnel have been determined to be too ineffective to be useful in experimentation. MTF agents will be sent through the slide and given every advantage to deal with any obstacle. 1562 is a safe class object that was brought to the Foundation's attention after a series of disappearances. Its main anomalous property being that when a subject goes down head first, arms at their side, they disappear right before the bottom. I'm in what appears to be some sort of alternate dimension. What makes you say that? Well, the sky is a lovely shade of red, and the moon looks like some sort of playground thingy. Thingy? We need accurate reporting. What is it? It's one of those dome things from a playground, you know, made of triangles. When we were kids, we called it the Thunderdome. Amusing. What else is there? 
It looks a lot like where we discovered 1562. A playground, but like evil. Yeah, not much else. I'll explore beyond. Holy sh- Additional testing will be required to answer the three most pertinent questions surrounding SCP-1562. One, by what mechanism are subjects teleported? Two, where do they go? And lastly, why they relive their last moments over and over again. Damn, I could just tell he was going to fail us. Well, what did you expect? You don't even know what's on the other side. You should remember your place, Gustav. Yes, Dr. Buck. We need someone we can rely on. Someone who isn't going to get themselves killed at the first sign of trouble. That's a rare thing here. Well, I think I know just the person. Good luck, Lawrence. You may begin the test. Initiating. He better make it back. Oh, he will. If there's one thing I know will motivate a man, it's love. Victims of 1562 find themselves teleported to a tightly packed tunnel made of dirt. Because of subject's position while going down the slide, movement is highly restricted. Special tools were designed to circumvent this problem. Well, it's just like you said it would be. Keep your head on a swivel. Something got the last guy. His name was Greg. I see Greg. Should I warn him? Negative. Just observe and report. There's a slide that's... moving. It's coming up behind Greg. I should stop it. Again? Negative. There's nothing you can do for him. His fate has already been determined. Holy shit! It got him. Ate him like it was some sort of animal. What is this place? That's your job to find out. What the? I just saw a kid run by. That would make sense. Several children were reported missing in the lead up to our discovery of 1562. Follow them. See where they lead you. Roger that. Agent Lawrence, continue your exploration. Yes, ma'am. Ah, something's got me. What is it? Describe what you're seeing. I'm a little busy right now. It was one of those talk tubes. Nasty. Is everything here trying to kill me? Oh, God. Don't worry about me, guys. I'm fine. No need to ask. Where are you now? Baseball diamond. Pitch it to me. Um, what? Pitch it. No one here wants to play with me. Are there others here? There used to be, but the monsters kept getting them. But not you, you're a superhero. A superhero? Yeah, like, like Batman. You got the utility belt and everything. But no mask, though. Why don't you have a mask? Must have left it in the bad cave. Kid, can you tell me what's going on? How can I get out of here? I only answer to the king. Now come on, play with me. Okay, kid. Maybe you can tell me what's going on here after this. Pitch it! What a kick, kid. Hey, wait! Welcome to the King's Palace. Looks more like a gazebo. Ah! We've lost contact with Lawrence. All signals have been severed. Don't worry, he can handle himself. Even then, the data he's returned so far is incredible. The next MTF we send will surely be the one to return. Give him time. You might be surprised, Dr. Logan. You stand before me, mortal, and I am not impressed. The kid seemed mighty impressed by me. I am a king. I am beyond such childish thoughts such as superheroes. What are you? What is this place? All that you see is my kingdom. I am all that there is and all there ever will be. You created this place. Why? 
Better yet, how? Hmm. I do not get to tell my tale often. So many visitors never reach the surface. Fine then. You wish to know my secrets? Tell me your secrets, oh glorious king. This pleases me. Very well. I was but a boy, but I was special. I had powers beyond the comprehension of even the smartest adults. I could move things with my mind, and even reshape them to my pleasure. So you had telekinetic powers? Call it what you will. I was powerful, and yet not invincible. A terrible accident befell me, but not before I created this kingdom. I don't understand. What accident? The playground can be a dangerous place. I see. So how do I get out of here? There is no escape. You shall remain here forever. Not even your soul can escape. Why? What do you gain from that? I desire only subjects for my realm. People who will do my bidding. You sound like a child. Don't upset him. I can control him when he's upset. Like I give a damn. This king before me, he's nothing but a bad attitude in the crown. How dare you! You don't scare me. Leave! I'm not leaving without my friend. Kid, come with me. You don't have to listen to this guy. It might sound crazy, but I think you're the one really in charge. You control this place. Really, mister? No! 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 Yeah, come on. Hey guys. SCP Foundation, Site 18, The Dead of Night. A lonely Foundation scientist makes his way to his office to leave for the day. Little does he know that tonight he will cross paths with what was a most deadly SCP, able to teleport from dark corner to dark corner like a deadly whisper. <laughs> All that was left in her wake was blood. Hello, I am Dr. Buck, and today we will be reviewing SCP-835-JP, otherwise known as Keteru Yamiko. Initially identified as a Keter, SCP-835-JP is now classified as, well, we'll get into that later in this presentation. Due to its nature, containment of SCP-835-JP is currently impossible. In the event of a suspicious death of a Foundation employee allegedly involved with this object, Mobile Task Force Q3 Bonfire is to cordon off the crime scene and investigate. It is recommended that the deaths be disguised as unrelated incidents whenever possible, with consideration for the morale impact on surrounding personnel. SCP-835-JP is often described as a teenaged girl named Keteru Yamiko that possesses long black hair and wears black school uniforms. On some occasions, the description of her age and appearance may increase or decrease by about 10 years. Keteru Yamiko is almost universally characterized as attractive. Her emotional state is often portrayed as melancholic due to her taciturnity. She avoids being seen at all costs, hiding in the shadows. Keteru Yamiko can teleport from one dark area to another, regardless of distance or obstructions. She utilizes this ability to approach, attack, and kill targets quickly with a large kitchen knife in her possession. She is also said to have the ability to control darkness at will, engulfing objects and making them disappear, although the principle behind this is unknown. Due to her abilities, she was kidnapped and raised as an assassin by a group of interests that is hostile to the Foundation, and it is believed that this is how her current personality was formed. 
SCP-835-JP was originally a phenomenon that occurred only to the Foundation personnel. First identified in 1995, the phenomenon occurs in a cycle of about one to three months. The subjects who encounter it disappear in a matter of seconds, usually with a large amount of blood left behind. No subject, dead or alive, has ever been rediscovered. Investigations have confirmed the subjects were fatally injured prior to their disappearance. There are no significant common features of SCP-835-JP in terms of subject, time, or location, except that the victim is invariably a Foundation employee, and the scene is in a dark place with poor visibility. Occurrence has been confirmed in alleys at night, dimly lit stairwells, photo labs, shadows under desks, etc. Due to its unpredictability, suddenness, and the fact that the victims disappear without exception, no experimental observations of this phenomenon have been successful, and the details remain unknown to date. Based on the limited information obtained from the testimonies of witnesses who were present at the scene, as well as surveillance video footage, it is also known that the victims acted as if they were being attacked by some imperceptible entity. However, the existence of the attacker has never been corroborated. Several years later, a booklet with a hand-drawn anime-style girl titled Artist's Impression of SCP-835-JP was found on the desk of research assistant Edwards. After reviewing the contents of the booklet on the spot, it was discovered that the character in question had been given the name Keteru Yamiko, along with a set of attributes such as personality, origins, and abilities. The booklet was submitted to head researcher Ken on the same day. This led to the following conversation. What made you create Keteru Yamiko in association with SCP-835-JP? Boredom, I guess. I don't have much to do except wait for the machines to process the data. Lots of downtime here. How very diligent. But you didn't answer my question. Listen, I know it sounds stupid, but waiting for data to come in on some murder monster... I don't... I don't know. Sometimes it just helps to think of these things as a bit more... normal, you know? And normal to you is an anime schoolgirl with a knife? Compared to most of the things here in the Foundation? Yeah, I'd say so. Is this character, Keteru Yamiko, based on a previously established intellectual property? Perhaps an anime series or manga? I mean, it's kind of taken from several. It's a bit of a cliche, right? Killer schoolgirl, black hair, huge knife. And drawing this fictionalized version of SCP-835-JP helps you cope with its existence? It's something I can imagine, at least. Otherwise, it could be... Anything. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Interesting. I see here that you even wrote a backstory for it. You do know this could potentially cause a memetic hazard. Our research into SCP-835-JP has been spotty at best. I was just goofing around. I don't really see what the big deal is. Several SCPs are affected or even manifested by our collective perception of them. In these cases, fiction and reality are constantly intertwined. If word of this Keteru Yamiko gets out, who knows what could happen? I didn't realize. I'm sorry. Since Incident 835, the phenomenon continued to stay inactive, defying its previous one to three month attack pattern. Due to this prolonged inactivity, it was speculated that the anomaly was influenced by the perceptions of the Foundation personnel. Dr. Sanders recommended and received approval to implement Protocol Idol 835 with the goal of embedding a shared perception of SCP-835-JP in the Foundation personnel. The Foundation opted to continue using research assistant Edwards' character, Keteru Yamiko, as basis for Protocol Idol 835, which was already acknowledged by a significant number of personnel and proven to be at least somewhat effective at warding after SCP-835-JP. The importance of smooth and immediate transmission of information was pivotal. Its components were as follows. 
Firstly, all documents and information referring to SCP-835-JP were revised to make it easier for the viewers to associate them with Keteru Yamiko by including a detailed setting and replacing the object's designation number with a unique name. In addition, as part of a publicity campaign for staff, a large number of public relations magazines, supplies, common items printed with the character visual of Keteru Yamiko, which was designed by the Foundation illustrators, were widely disseminated at the facilities. Fictional novels, manga, animations with Keteru Yamiko as the main character were produced in sequence, and their viewing was recommended. Through these efforts, the Foundation has succeeded in making all personnel share the recognition of SCP-835-JP Keteru Yamiko in a matter of months, and no activation of the object has been reported since. Although these publicity campaigns are currently being scaled down, items featuring Keteru Yamiko remain in various facilities in order to maintain a certain level of recognition, and the Foundation regularly organizes creative sessions based on the theme of Keteru Yamiko. The last known sighting of SCP-835 occurred at Site-18, a small outpost in the Pacific Ocean. In accordance with set standard operating procedures, Foundation personnel were sent out to manage the Site-18's reaction to the death. <clears throat> uh, can you describe your experience with Keteru Yamiko? Well, I've been briefed on 835. Er Keteru before. I know of the comics or whatever, but I never paid them much mind. Those sessions are extremely important. Only by actively participating in them are we to eradicate this menace. I know, but I never thought she would show up here of all places. Neither did Dr. Nelson, to be honest. Let's start at the beginning. Now, according to our data, Dr. Nelson entered the security hallway at 2135 to leave for the night. Is this correct? Yeah, that's correct. I watch every person come and leave. We waved at each other, like we always do. Or did. Then what happened? The lights started to flicker. The wiring in Site 18 has always been spotty. We joked that instead of fixing it, they just classify it an SCP. Please try to stick to the events leading up to the attack. Right, sorry doctor. Anyway, he walked out of my view. I watched him on my monitor as he was about to exit. Then he saw something in the shadows and stopped. What was it? It was hard to tell, but it was staring right at it. It was like something was bubbling in the shadows. Then suddenly, I saw her. Keteru Yamiko. Yeah, it was like an optical illusion. She just popped into focus. But she wasn't like what she was in the manga. She looked tired. What do you mean? Did she look old? No, not old. She looked like she was on autopilot. Anybody who has read the manga always said she was this big goofball. Well, really, she's only like that in the training videos. In the manga, she's got a reason to be so goofy. See, she has a... <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not important. Um, what happened after she appeared? The camera feed cut out. When it came back, Dr. Nelson was gone. Keteru Yamako was alone, standing in whatever was left of him. It was creepy. She just faded away after that. Now, this Dr. Nelson, I assume he was briefed on Keteru Yamiko? Um, surely he had participated in some of her related events. He was a level three after all. Yeah, he was the guy that organized them. He was a big fan of the whole thing. He even had a special pop of her made for his desk. Said it was for training purposes. Hmm, that should be in his personal effects. Why do you think she came after him? How would I know? Aren't you supposed to be the expert? Well, you knew, Dr. Nelson. Why would she single him out? I don't know. Maybe she was visiting her biggest fan or something. Hmm. Is there anything else you would like to add? I don't think you'll be seeing her again. There was something about the way she looked that makes me think she's done with being what we've made her into. Hmm. Noted. But the videotape we've recovered has no appearance of her. Typical. I know what I saw, though. And I believe you. We must always stay vigilant for Keteru Yamiko. SCP-835-JP is probably a manifestation of the instinctive fear that something threatening oneself may be lurking in the darkness. 
But the imaginary monster we once feared has now been reduced to a cliched character with Protocol Idol 835. SCP-835-JP Kiteru Yamiko has been neutralized by Protocol Idol 835. The possibility of strengthening containment by expanding the scope of the protocol outside the Foundation is currently being studied in order to prepare for potential containment breaches that could result from a major cognito hazard or similar incidents within the Foundation. While Kiteru Yamiko is designated safe, we are still unsure about how she manifested in the first place. Further research into the phenomena of SCP-835-JP has stalled, as no new data has presented itself. Armed with the knowledge from this presentation, we hope that you will continue to think of SCP-835-JP as just Kiteru Yamiko. If you even touch that break, we are going to die! Today's briefing is to provide contextual information on SCP-1913 and prepare a strike force for Mission Theta-13. The primary mission of which is the capture and containment of all instances of SCP-1913 which is the collective term for three separate entities, designated SCP-1913-1, Dash 2, and Dash 3. The instances do not show signs of mortality, either regenerating fatal injuries over time, or reappearing near the place of death when its body has been destroyed within an hour. Dash 1 is a sapient ceramic statue depicting a cat. It is capable of communication, emanating a young female voice from its interior. The ink covering SCP-1913-1's eyes, mouth, and paws upon contact with a living subject's epidermis will be absorbed through the skin. The affected areas will rapidly begin to dissolve and eventually disappear. Now, SCP-1913-1, what can you tell me about the other two instances? Haven't I already had this conversation with one of your kind before? In the last interview, you told the agent that holy water would melt Dash 2. That turned out to not be the case, to say the least. <laughs> I wish I was there to see the look on their face when it didn't work. I don't think that's amusing. Well, then you should lighten up a bit. Hmm. I could bring Dr. Buck in here. She would be less than patient with you. The mean lady who shook my cage? No, thank you. What did you want to know? Step not Freddy and Telly. Can you confirm that's their names? Yeah, sure. Totally. Hmm, okay, great. Can you confirm the method in which Dash 3 controls Dash 2? Control? I wouldn't call it control. It's more like aiming a dog. A dog made of bones. Hmm. What is the process in which Dash 3 creates its intense heat? He gets really angry. Oh, I think Dr. Buck is nearby. Okay, fine. I don't know. See, aren't things so much simpler when you cooperate? Now, what weakness can you tell us about Dash 2 and Dash 3? I guess holy water won't work again? No, it won't. It's some sort of material. I don't know which. Rock or mineral? That hardly narrows it down. It's time. This one needs to go. Dash 2 and Dash 3 have been sighted 50 kilometers to the south. What type of rock are we talking about? The hard kind. Dr. Collingwood, we need to get this thing out of here. Right. <clears throat> Take it away. Come on, little one. I'll keep you safe. SCP-1913-2 skeleton is human in structure, with the exception of its skull and digits which appear to belong to a large canine. 
It is capable of moving at speeds of up to 65 kilometers per hour, despite lacking the tissues required for mobility. It doesn't appear to be sapient, and seems to act almost entirely on the orders given to it by either Dash 1 or Dash 3. Subjects that are attacked by Dash 2 will show continued life signs until sustaining fatal injuries from another source, including non-anomalous wounds and the effects of Dash 1's ink. SCP-1913-3 is what looks to be an adolescent male black Labrador retriever, lacking a mouth, nose, and eyes. Its face consists of several ragged holes mimicking a grinning visage, which reveals a dim white light. Dash 3 is sapient and refers to itself as Freddy. When it collides with an object or some other subject, it will emit a burst of gray-colored flames from the holes in its face. Flames produced in this manner reach temperatures of up to 12,000 degrees Celsius and have the expected effect upon coming into contact with non-living objects. SCP-1913-1 was discovered at Norfolk Harbor upon investigation of a local shipwreck. Agent Crowley discovered SCP-1913-1 in the wreckage of the Destiny, which was believed to have been in transit to New York City. Two bodies were found in the wreckage, but the remaining 23 passengers were missing. Can I say something for the record? Sure, go ahead. It was a mistake to put Dr. Hayward with the cats in the cradle. The kid's bright, but he's too green. He just got out of school. He hardly knows the difference between mind-altering effects and info hazards. He didn't do anything wrong, but if, if he'd just... I apologize. I like the kid and I'm obviously biased, but he could have been more prepared if he was assigned to a safer group first. Experience these things instead of getting some lecture about it. Sorry, I needed to get that off my chest. It's fine. You wanted to ask about Encounter 29, right? Please. Right. We only needed basic supplies, food and fuel. We weren't expecting to spend more than a few minutes at 45, but we were all kinds of jumpy. We hadn't seen the dog or the girl for days, so we were expecting something from them. Hayward and I were hauling Dash 1 to the site's garage, and sure enough, the car exploded behind us. They must have been following us, waiting until we got to another site to attack, because they seemed to have attacked us immediately after the 12 of us got out. And this is when you alerted Site 45 and attempted to reach the roof for evac? Yes, either that or let them do God knows what with it. Didn't matter much though, because we ended up in some poor guy's lab with those two banging down the door. That thing. Three just walked right up to me. Didn't do anything. It didn't attack. It didn't explode. It didn't have the girl attack and then explode. It just sat there. Only thing I could think to say was, why? It's been a long time since I felt so powerless. It told me that it was doing this as a service. That its flame was redemption. It said they can't see, they can't hear, they can't feel. They're just left with themselves. See no evil and all that. What happened to Dr. Hayward? The idiot threw a microscope at it. Didn't matter much though. Dash 3 knocked him into the counter afterwards. It was steamed, clearly. Hayward was in some pain, but he was soaked too. Prevented him from burning too bad. I don't know why, but 3 told 2 to kill him for it. Maybe it thought the kid was beneath it, or figured that 2 would do a better job. Ended up picking the kid up and throwing him at the far wall, crashing into these jars of sulfur before... Well, before Dash 2 reached through his chest. Dash 2 was about to charge him, but it stopped. 3 seemed to get angry at 2 till it took a look at the rocks covering Hayward. I put 2 and 2 together and assumed that the rocks were what was spooking him, so I did what I could. It felt good, seeing those things actually running from us for a change. Hey, is that all? I'm hoping to see some people at the infirmary before visiting hours close. You said to remind you that you wanted to share a concern about the SCP-1913 entities as a whole. What was it? Oh uh, yeah. Hayward was going to report it to Site-45. He's been interrogating Dash-1 for a while and got something out of it. He's had his suspicions about how SCP-1913 functions and felt that there was something more to it than what we knew. Didn't tell me what, but it seemed urgent. Thought it was worth bringing up. Listen, I'd tell you if I knew it, but all I really know is that I lived to see those things tear out Hayward's heart, and so did he. Dr. Hayward was released from intensive care one month after his interview, recovering from third-degree burns over his arms and torso, and the cauterization of a hole through his chest. With the information obtained from Encounter 29, Foundation personnel started experimenting with sulfur in Dash 1. They found it had extreme aversion to the substance, and quickly devised a plan of action for Mission Theta 13. 
Dash 1 was driven to an abandoned quarry located in an undisclosed part of the Mojave Desert. Dash 2 and 3 were lured deep into the mine, at which point sulfur mineral dust was used to separate each instance of 1913 and contain it in a sulfur-coated prisoner transport vehicle. All SCP-1913 instances were relocated and contained at least 1,600 kilometers away from each other, in areas where the Foundation has established major sites. 